Hello and welcome back to the Biochemistry for Health Sciences channel. In today's video, we shall talk about the importance of the Henderson-Hasselberg equation in medicine. Although the Henderson-Hasselberg equation has many uses, we shall focus on two major applications. One is how it affects the chemical form of a biomolecule or of a drug at a certain pH. So this is important not only in uh, biochemistry or physiology, but it's also an important aspect in pharmacology. The second aspect we'll talk about, application of Henderson-Hasselberg, would be in blood pH. Before we look into the applications of the Henderson-Hasselbeck equation, let's discuss some basic chemistry, general chemistry, and a little bit of uh, basic organic chemistry. Let's look at these numbers called Ka, Pka, Kb, and Pkb. So consider this drug called amphetamine. It has Amine, this is an amine NH2 functional group. Uh, as you know from your organic chemistry, amines are weak bases. So amphetamine is a weak basic drug. If you dissolve amphetamine in water, you would get its acid form, what we call the conjugate acid or the protonated form and it will give you the OH, which is what makes this a base. How much of this drug gets converted into the protonated form is given by a number called the Kb. So basically the Kb is the concentration of the products OH and P divided by the concentration of the reactant, which is the unprotonated form. This is ignored, the concentration of water. Kb, you can see, comes out to be a very small number, one times 10 to the minus four. For convenience, we can convert this small number into something more easy to explain, a, a easier number rather than saying 1 times 7 minus 4. So what we do is take PKB instead of KB. This P here stands for minus log. So if you take a minus log of this number, you get a very easy number to explain to your to the physician or the clinician. So this PKB is 4. Now PKA, PKA plus PKB is equal to 14. So if PKB is four, then PKA is 10. So for amphetamine, which is a weak base, the PKB is four, and the KB is one times zero minus four. Now compare that to a strong base such as sodium hydroxide. How much sodium hydroxide breaks down to give you sodium and the hydroxide? That number Kb, you can see is 0 0.6. So compare that 0 0.6 to one times 10 minus four. So this is a much bigger number compared to this, which means more and more, a lot of sodium hydroxide will break down to give you the products. Same thing, we take the minus log of Kb and you get 0 0.2. So compare 0 0.2 with four. So much lower PKB compared to a weak base. The PKA again can be calculated and that will come out to be 13.8 because 13.8 plus 0 0.2 gives you 14. Now let's consider a weak acid drug and an example would be aspirin which is a weak acid 
when you dissolve aspirin in water, this hydrogen comes out as a proton, which can be written H3O plus or for simplicity H plus. And the remaining drug is the conjugate base or the unprotonated form. The proton has been lost, so this is the unprotonated form. Once again, how much this has broken down to give you this product is explained by this number. Since it's an acid, we use Ka instead of B. B is for base, A is for acid here. Once again, we take the concentration of products divided by the concentration of reactant. We ignore water and that gives us the number. So Ka here, you can see it's a very small number, 3.2 times 10 minus 4. PKA is minus log of that, and that comes out to be 3.5. Now let's look at a strong acid. Compare, let's compare a strong acid with a weak acid. So nitric acid is a strong acid. How much it breaks down to give you the protons and the product nitrate depends on the Ka. And you see the Ka here is a very big number, 23, compared to 3 times 10 to the power of minus 4, which is a very small number. This is a very large number. The larger the number, the more this breaks down to give you the products. And the pKa, if you calculate minus log of 23, comes out to be minus 1.37. Very small number compared to this. Okay, so the smaller the Ka, the larger the pKa, the larger the Ka, the smaller the pKa because pKa is minus log of that number. So in pharmacology, you will come across many drugs that might be weak basic drugs as well as drugs that are weakly acidic drugs. However, drugs is not the only thing we have to worry about in medicine. Uh, the body itself has many biomolecules, many biomolecules that can act as weak acids and bases. And they are everywhere. They are, they are in all organs. Uh, they are in cells, outside cells, in your bloodstream, uh, in your all kinds of fluids. So this Weak acids and weak bases are very, very common in the human body and therefore we need to understand their nature and their behavior in our body. So instead of uh, using terms as, such as base and conjugate acid or the acid and conjugate base, let's keep these terms simple and let's just consider the two forms of a weak acid or weak base, the protonated form and the unprotonated form. So in this case, in amphetamine, here is the protonated form. That means they mean here is NH3 plus, has the extra proton. And when it loses that proton, you get the unprotonated form. So here they mean is NH2. And because we are considering the acid dissociation, how the acid part is breaking down, we will use only pKa and not pKb. So the pKa of this reaction where the acid breaks down to give you the proton, the pKa is 10. Similarly, for the acidic drug aspirin, once again, we'll just consider the two forms. Here, the carboxyl has the proton, so this is protonated. It breaks down to give you the proton, and then it becomes unprotonated, or the U form. In this case, the pKa is 3.5. So by Following this format, we simply stick to the same numbers, pKa, and we simply consider two forms, the protonated form and the unprotonated form. So let's keep things simple. So 
So here is the first application of the Henderson-Hasselberg equation, and that is how can we determine the chemical form of the biomolecule or drug at a certain pH. So for example, here is amphetamine. There are two forms of amphetamine that could be present in aqueous solutions, including in our body, which is aqueous. Uh, the protonated form or the unprotonated form. So suppose we want to know what percent of amphetamine is at is protonated at pH 1. So for example, in your stomach. In your stomach, for example, if you ate amphetamine, what percent of the drug will be in this form? What percent of the drug would be in this form? Or in let's say in pH 7.4 in blood. What happens in blood? What percent would be in the P form? What percent would be in the U form? Okay, so Henderson-Hasselberg equation will help us calculate these numbers. Same question can be asked for aspirin. What percentage of aspirin is in the P form at pH 1? And what percent will be in the U form at pH 1 in your gastric fluid in your stomach? Or what about pH 7.4? What percent in your blood? Would the aspirin be as the protonated form and what percent of aspirin would be in the unprotonated form? So these are questions that can be answered by using this equation called the henderson hasselberg equation. So why, why is it important to know what form a drug or molecule is uh, is it in the P form, protonated, or the unprotonated form? And the answer is uh, the form of the chemical is going to affect its biological behavior. It's going to affect its absorption, its distribution in your bloodstream, uh, even how it is metabolized and eventually how it is excreted. So, for example, if you look at amphetamine, the protonated form is more water soluble and therefore can be excreted much more quicker by your kidneys. However, it cannot cross cell membranes very well compared to the unprotonated form. The unprotonated form is better in crossing cell membranes, but it is less water soluble and cannot be excreted readily. So if somebody had an overdose of amphetamine, we want the drug to be in the protonated form so that it can be excreted more readily. In case of aspirin, the protonated form that doesn't have any charge compared to the amphetamine where there's a positive charge. So because it doesn't have any charge, it's neutral, it's less water soluble, but it's better in crossing membranes. On the other hand, the unprotonated form has a negative charge, which makes it more water-soluble, more readily excreted by the kidneys. However, this is less efficient in crossing membranes. So if somebody had an aspirin overdose, you want the U form so that it can be readily excreted by the kidneys. So this is one very important application of henderson hasselberg It will tell us what percent of the drug is P or U because the P or U form of the drug affects its biological behavior. So it's not only small molecules whose structure change can change with, with changes in pH, uh, even larger molecules such as proteins they can change their shapes when the pH changes. And, and when the shape changes for the protein, then the function, the functions of the proteins can change. And of course, that is going to affect uh, our anatomy as well as our physiology. So just to summarize, the protonated or the unprotonated form is important for understanding pharmacology, for understanding biomolecules in our body, small biomolecules, which is important for physiology as well as for biochemistry, and also important for understanding the shapes of macromolecules, such as especially proteins, 
which do many, many things for our cells. So basically you can see pH changes the forms, U or P, of these chemicals, and then these forms affect our physiology. So if you were simply interested in which form predominates at a certain pH, the U form or the P form, then you can use this simple guideline. These are some examples of common functional groups that can exist as your P form or U form. Uh, so for example, if a molecule had an amine, this would be the P form. If the molecule X had a carboxyl, that's how the carboxyl P form is. The P form of the sulfhydryl group, the P form of the hydroxyl group. Once we know the pK, as long as the pH is less than this pK, this is going to be the predominant form of this molecule having this certain functional group. When the pH is exactly equal to pK, then 50% of the molecule will exist in the P form and the other 50% of the molecules will exist in the U form. However, when the pH is greater than the pK, then the predominant form is going to be the unprotonated form, the U form. And for an amine, the unprotonated form is, X N is NH2. For carboxyl is CO minus. This is the unprotonated form for sulfhydryl. And this is the unprotonated form for the hydroxyl. So when you look at these common functional groups, the P form or the U form, what you see is uh, these groups are either neutral, they don't have any charge. For example, this is zero charge, which we do not write zero charge, zero charge, zero charge. Or they could be positively charged. And the only positive charge that is commonly found in your body comes from amines the protonated form of amine, the rest are all negatively charged. Carboxyl is negatively charged, your sulfhydryl unprotonated can give you negative charge and your hydroxyl can give you negative charge. So that's something we do see in our body, in our cells, uh, a lot of negative charges, a lot of negative charges around, but positive charges are less common compared to negative charges. So just to summarize, if you're simply interested in knowing which form predominates at a certain pH, this is the guideline we need to use. All we have to know is the pKa of that group. And if the pH is less than pKa, then it's protonated. If the pH is greater than pKa, then it's unprotonated. And when the pH is equal to pKa, then we are talking about 50% P, 50% U. But what if we want to know exactly how many percent of a certain molecule functional group exists as P or U? So let's look at this example. What percent, what percent of the amino group so we are talking about this amino group of the amino acid glycine is unprotonated. We want to know how much of it is unprotonated. That means what is the form of this amine group as this NH2? At pH 8.7, 8.7, but the pK of this group is 9.7. Okay, so that's what we want to know. How much of this group is in the unprotonated form at pH 8.7, given that the pK is 9.7? So we can solve this quite easily. Remember that there are only two forms. So the, there is the U form, and then there is the P form. There are only two forms of the functional group. So the percent U, we want to know what's the percent U, is simply equal to the amount of U divided by the total, which is U plus P, because since there are only two form, forms, times 100. 
okay so if you know the amount of u divided by the total which is u plus p times 100 that will give you percent u so we proceed with the henderson hasselberg equation we use this equation p h is equal to p k a plus log of concentration of u divided by concentration of p ph is 8.7 pka for the mean group is 9.7 log plus log u divided by p so 8.7 bring 9.7 over this side will give you minus 1 that's 8.7 minus 9.7 so minus 1 is equal to log u divided by p so we can solve uh, u divided by p u divided by p simply becomes when log goes over to the other side it becomes anti-log so if we take anti-log of minus one you get 0 0.1 so basically u divided by p equals 0 0.1 or u equals 0 0.1 p so now we can substitute this in this equation percent u is u divided by u plus p times 100 so instead of u instead of u here we just found what is u u is 0 0.1 p so we just put 0 0.1 p instead of u again instead of u here we put 0 0.1 p plus this p here times 100 so we get 0 0.1 p now 0 0.1 plus 1, so 0 0.1 P plus P times 100. So this is 0 0.1 P. So 0 0.1 plus 1, this is actually 1. So that's 1.1 P times 100. The P cancels off. And when you calculate this, you get 9%. So at P, it's 8.7 only 9% of this group only 9% of this group exists as the unprotonated form which means 91% exists as the protonated form okay so this is uh, how we use the henderson hasselberg equation to calculate exactly what percent of a functional group exists as the protonated and what percent at the unprotonated given a certain pH. So all we need to know is what's a pH and what's the pK and we can use the henderson hasselberg equation to solve U as well as P. And this makes sense because remember I told you that if the pH is less than the pKa in this case it is 8.7 is the pH we're interested in pKa is 9.7 then what happens is most of the group is protonated and that's exactly what we see 91% is protonated very little is unprotonated only 9% is unprotonated so clearly the predominant form when the pH is less than pKa the predominant form is going to be the protonated form so that's the guideline we talked about earlier let's look at another example what percent of the amino group of lysine again the same amino group of lysine is unprotonated u at ph 9.7 if its pk is also 9.7 so we proceed the same way and uh, use the Henderson-Hasselberg equation, pH is 9.7, pK is also 9.7. When you bring 9.7 on the other side, you get 0. So log U over P is 0. So U over P is equal to anti-log of 0, which comes out to be 1. So basically, U divided by P equals 1, which is same as saying U is equal to P. So now you put instead of u since u is nothing but p you put p instead of u so that's p 
divided by p plus p and you come out and then you solve this equation you get 50 percent okay so the concentration of u is 50 percent which means the concentration of p is also 50 percent and that's exactly what we said when the p is when the p is is equal to pka then 50% of the group exists as the protonated and 50% exists as the unprotonated form. So basically, the pKa can be considered as a pH. The pKa can be defined as that pH at which that functional group exists as 50% U or 50% P. Uh, it is important to remember that pKa values are not constant, okay? So they do change. So that, for example, the pKa of amine in this molecule, methylamine, is 10.6 because of the nature of the methyl group. However, the pKa of the amine in this amino acid lysine is 9.7 compared to 10.6 here you can see it's dropped down to 9.7 and that's because of its environment this amine group is next to an electron withdrawing carboxyl group so that makes it easier to release its proton okay so it's important to note that pk values change because of the environment, what other groups are, are found in that molecule, and also whether the group is nearby other charged or polar groups. Okay, so if the amine is near a charged group or polar group, its pKa is going to change. Okay, so besides that, the change in dielectric constant will affect the pKa value of the amine or any other functional group. So a good example of this would be a protein. Okay, a protein is very folded, extremely folded structure. Outside, it's more like water. Inside, it's very hydrophobic. All the hydrophobic groups are inside the protein. So inside, it's more like oil. Okay, so if an amine group was here, it will have a different pK compared to an amine group that was more on the inside of the protein, okay? So compared to the surface or the interior, the pKa value of the same functional group can change. Okay, so in general, we don't try to memorize pKa's. We need to determine the pKa's of that group. Okay, so with that background, let's go back to amphetamine. And now let's see what happens to this molecule when we change the pH from one, very strong acidic conditions to 14, very strong basic conditions. What happens to these forms? You know, what percentage is U, what percentage is P when we change the pH? So let's, let's look at this one pH at a time. Okay, so in biochemistry, we use pKa's, not pKb's, we use pKa's. So although this is a base, we will be looking at this reaction where the acid form of amphetamine, really the conjugate acid, but we'll just call it the acid form, how this acid form breaks down to give you the, the base. So the acid form is your P form and the actual amphetamine which is a weak basic drug this is your u form okay so the pka of this molecule is 10. so what is this drug at ph1 again using the henderson hasselberg equation we know the pka is 10 the ph is 1 we can calculate what percentage is protonated and what percentage is unprotonated and if we do that what we get is 100% of this molecule, amphetamine, this drug amphetamine, will be in this form called the P form, the protonated form. So it is positively charged. We do the same thing for pH2. We see 
Again, 100% is protonated positively charged. We do that for pH 3, still the same thing, 100% protonated. pH 4, 100% protonated. pH 5, 100% protonated. pH 6, still 100% protonated. pH 7, still 100% protonated. Now, when we hit pH 8, remember the pK is 10. So now we are two units below the pK. Now, when we use the Henderson Hasselberg and calculate, we, we get 99% is protonated. Remember the pK is 10. This is at pH 8, so predominant form is the protonated form. And that's what the henderson Hasselberg calculation shows. 99% is protonated. Now a little bit of the drug starts losing its proton and you get the unprotonated form. That's 1%, 1% unprotonated. Now when you go from pH 8 to pH 9, pH 9, now you see it's from 99% it has dropped down to 91% protonated and the unprotonated has gone up. Now, when you go to pH 10, which is exactly equal to pKa, the henderson hasselberg equation shows, will show you that 50% will be protonated, 50% unprotonated because the pH is the same as the pKa. So, at P, pH 10, we have 50-50. We have now you can see, you will see in the next one, as we go to pH 11, as you increase to go past pK 10, pH 10, now we are heading, we are going to have more and more of this becoming the unprotonated form. And that's exactly what happens. At pH 11, 91%, the predominant form now is the U form. So from 50% at pH 10, it went up to 91%. And now the P form is the minor form, okay? Because now we have exceeded the pKa, the pH has exceeded the pKa. And if we go to pH 12, now only 1% is P form and 99% is U form. So once again, P, pH 12 is much greater than pKa, which is 10. So the U form is the predominant form. At pH 13, using the henderson hasselberg we will find that all 100% of the drug is now unprotonated. And that also remains the same at pH 14. So here is the summary of the uh, of the how the way the drug form the nature of drug changes at different pH. So you can see here is pH one to fourteen. Here is the percentage protonated form. You can see it's predominant, predominant, predominant form until it hits the pKa of ten. So once the pH is the same as pKa, then it's fifty percent. And once you buy, you go cross the pKa. If the pH increases more than the pKa, then the P form becomes the minor form. Again, the opposite is for the U. It's, it's the minor form until it hits the pKa. And then after that, it becomes the major form of the drug. So although this example is for amphetamine, which has this amine group, um, once you know the pK of any functional group, um, you should be able to um, estimate or calculate what percentage would be in protonated and what percentage of that functional group would be unprotonated. If there were two groups, let's say there was a carboxyl here, then you would have to do the same thing for each functional group at a certain pH. 
you calculate the major form of this at a certain pH and the major form of this at a certain at that pH. Okay, so if you have two groups or three groups or four groups, you have to do these calculations for one group at a time. So that's the first application of the Henderson Hasselberg equation, calculating the pro percent protonated or unprotonated form of a certain chemical at a certain pH. The second application of this Henderson Hasselberg, which is very, very important in physiology, uh, and then of course later in pathophysiology, is the use of this equation in calculating or in understanding why our blood pH is 7.4. What makes our blood pH 7.4? So in our body, we are producing carbon dioxide all the time uh, in metabolism. This carbon dioxide, some of it can dissolve in water and give us carbonic acid. This is carbonic acid. So that's a weak acid which can then break down to give you protons and the unprotonated form which is bicarbonate. So carbonic acid is the protonated form, the bicarbonate is the unprotonated form. And the pKa of this reaction is 6.8. One. This is the most important buffer that we find in our blood. Okay, so using this, we can explain why our pH is 7.4 and how it is maintained at 7.4. So let's use the Henderson Hasselberg equation. Let's look at this part of the equation, and the pKa of this reaction is 6.1. So pH equals pK plus log U divided by P. 6.1 is the pKa. U is the bicarbonate. P is the carbonic acid. This is P and this is U. Okay, so we can measure, we have techniques to measure the concentration of bicarbonate. So this is not a problem. We have analytical techniques to measure this, but it's very difficult to measure the concentration of carbonic acid. Okay, this is not possible to measure. So what we do instead is we know that the concentration of carbonic acid can be calculated by multiplying the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which we can actually measure. We have very good ways to measure the concentration of carbon dioxide, but because carbon dioxide is a gas, we look at what we call the partial pressure. P stands here for partial pressure. So we can calculate or we can actually determine the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, multiply that by the solubility coefficient of carbon dioxide in human blood, which is 0 0.03. So if we do that, 0 0.03 multiplied by PCO2, we can actually measure this, we can measure this. And then when we put these numbers in, we can calculate the pH of uh, normal healthy blood. Okay, so this is the equation we can use. Now, when we measure the PCO2 in, in healthy blood in, in a person, uh, who has a normal acid-base balance, it comes out to be about 40, 40 millimeters mercury. If we measure the bicarbonate concentration, it comes out to be 24 millimolar. So this is a concentration, this is partial pressure. We put these numbers in, 24 here, 40 here, do the calculation for the henderson Hasselberg, and you will get a number of 7.4. So what this means is that if your bicarbonate, if your body maintains your bicarbonate at 24 and your body maintains the carbon dioxide partial pressure at 40, then your pH will come out to be 7.4.
So your bicarbonate concentration in your blood is actually maintained by your kidneys. Okay, so the kidneys regulate. If you have too much bicarbonate, the kidneys excrete the excess bicarbonate. If you have too little bicarbonate, then the kidneys will not excrete uh, bicarbonate. While the CO2, how much CO2 or the partial pressure of CO2 you have in your blood, that is regulated by your lungs. Okay, so if you have too much CO2, you will start, uh, your lungs will start working faster and you will get rid of the CO2 faster. And if you have too little CO2, then you will, your respiratory rate will go down and you will not uh, exhale too quickly. Okay, so between the lungs and the kidneys, these two organs play a very important role. These two organs will help maintain your blood pH at 7.4. So clearly this is a very important uh, group of tests. Okay, arterial blood gases, we call this arterial blood gases. So in here we have our pH. You can see the pH. You, we need to know the PCO2 and also the bicarbonate. So the blood pH is very important because the blood pH 7.4. As you know, if you change the pH, the groups where they are protonated or unprotonated forms can change. And when they change, the, they can affect the shapes of biomolecules <clears throat> and especially proteins. And when protein shapes changes, their functions change. And when their functions change, you're affecting the anatomy and physiology. Okay, so these are the two applications, uh, important applications of the henderson Hasselberg in medicine. One is trying to determine the nature or the chemistry of the uh, chemical at a certain pH, whether it's found in the protonated form or unprotonated form, because the chemistry of the chemical is going to affect its ADME, its biological behavior. And the second is the use of the henderson hasselberg equation in understanding why our blood pH is kept at 7.4, and in later videos, we will talk more about uh, this aspect, which is very, very important. We'll look at what happens, uh, how diseases can affect your blood pH, okay, and how your body tries to compensate for problems in either your bicarbonate or your carbon dioxide. Okay, so this will be topics for future videos, uh, things like metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, or metabolic alkalosis, or respiratory alkalosis. All of these are very important clinical topics that will be discussed in future videos. All right, uh, thank you for joining us for this video. I hope uh, you have a wonderful day and we'll hopefully see you in the next video.